kind of nice and sort of homey and so forth, but uh, not very practical, as you can see. I'm not sure it's ADA compliant. Now, when they were loading this thing on the barge, didn't they all lean against it and physically push it so it would clear the structure? They may have. I wasn't. I wasn't there for that point. Jim Chance told me that. They, they, I know they did pick that up in one piece. Somehow they got some uh, timbers through it and so forth. It had a little bit of fire around it at one point, you can see. But it's actually, it's actually a wonderful building. We don't really uh, He was here when Ted Santarelli and the original people started the museum. And he came over and That's after we took it over. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't think it was there beforehand. And you drove around, and we actually, let's see, how did the road go here? I forget. It was well, the garage was kind of at an angle. It was not square with the right-of-way. My memory is it was about this orientation. And uh, there was space in front of it, and you came around in front of it and then on up the, uh, the right-of-way. a gulch underneath it. You can see the continuation of it down there. That was that was built much later. And this was our pit and unloading ramp. So the truck, yeah, the road did go that way because you could back the highway monster in here and then run the streetcar off and right up there. And it was our pit. But the cars were way up here at this high. And we had very uh, rotten wood here. We ran the pit jacks around on to an arm. Remember taking the 838 armature up, up here. We had two jacks. Just over here was the lean-to, and it was sort of grown up to brush on both sides. It was the nearest thing to a station, pretty much at the end of the track. And at one point, we had a gray line tour driver from Boston who, on his own, turned in here with his air-conditioned bus and his tour. And he thought it was so great, and it turned out he was an old motorman that he got them to add it to his tour. It was an all-day tour from Boston up to, to Portland. And we would simply leave 
the handles for the car in that lean-to. And he would pull into this little country lane, and here's his streetcar sitting in the weeds, and he'd get the handles out, take his people off his air-conditioned bus, and go down the line with it. Well, more and, than that, he actually started the gasoline power station to tell people to wait here. He walked the and started up. Well, some of the time we had it running and on low power, if there was somebody here, and at least when I was here, most of the time there was, so we knew about what time he was due, and we'd have the thing on idle. And then, of course, the system then, there was a rectifier that put enough power on the line for lights and air compressor of one car. And we'd notch open, and that would blow the circuit breaker on that thing, and then you'd hear the sterling end, and then your lights would come on again, and you'd have power for the for the motors, for the traction motors, and if you didn't draw power for about a minute or a minute and a half, then it would drop down to idle and you had to go through this again. You'd notch open once, the lights would go out, and then, and away you'd go. Are you still telling stories? You Matt? betcha. Yeah, good. Smile, you're on candid camera. <laughs> we are. Good morning. The, uh, the is talking about the Nettie's Oldie Gifty Shop. Henry Brainerd, wife, Henry was one of our early wife was in a natural car box greater, and she, her idea was to build a, a, a gift shop, a store. So it wasn't out of uh, like chicken. It was actually the chicken food from the store at the uh, butler house, which I'll talk about later on. And it had a flat one that folded down here and it folded up like that. So that was our start of the present store that we have. So we have evolved an awful lot. And always known as the gifty shop with an E on the end, and everybody pronounced the E. Well, <laughs> both of them also. Now, something else you're probably aware of. This is the Atlantic Shoreline right away. And when you come up the uh, log cabin road, you can see the signal, uh, because the road just a little bit higher, you can see the first signal up there flashing, uh, or whatever it is at that time of day. And as you drive down log cabin road, it's very observant on the left up this way, you can see a slight embankment. Uh, the road, I guess, gradually encroached on it as it got farther down, but uh, up here, uh, it was quite prominent. And then this was called Miller's Siding. I think it was just a one end and uh, siding uh, pull uh, the cars in here, which were then loaded up primarily with lumber, a little lumber, and pulled it up the wood. And this, this area, our right away, uh, not the right away, but the wood is owned by the Diamond Match Company. For that Hercules Powder Company. The powder is for boxes to put dynamite in. They find them actually. We've got four of them and have such big pieces so they, they match themselves. <laughs> and I was telling Mac on the way down, I believe Fred Plow helped us find a frog here. I, I was told about that. Now remember, that was only how many years before we were founded that this was pulled out? Well, I think it was torn up in 29, and we came in 10 years later in 39. It last operated, my understanding is, in 27, but wasn't dismantled until 39, or at least part of it wasn't dismantled until 39. And people have still fine spikes up there. They obviously weren't concerned about those, but they were concerned about the rail, which then went over to the Sanford Springdale line, and then some of it came back here again. It was right back where it came out of. I'm sure we located the rail exactly where they came out. Like <laughs> 61 pieces of rail. They were really something to move. 60 pound, I think. 60 or 70 pounds. 60, I believe. So anyway, this is the common problem. We used to it. On the line, they, they went off the main line. It wasn't until fairly uh, late in the game that we were actually able to use the right away.
one hand with one over the other side. 12 inch approximately square reinforced concrete. I mean, how overbuilt and how difficult. Uh, I remember George Burdick will be around here someday, cut his finger on a hacksaw when he was putting in some of the reinforcing for the, for the door support. The doors are from the east, uh, the Eagle Street car barn of the uh, Boston Elevated Railway in East Boston. The trans height uh, on the roof, I believe, came from somewhere down near the Lehigh Valley Transit. I mean, this stuff just, it, we were really early in this kind of building. We evolved and evolved uh, in, in our building construction. The problem with this building, when we actually began to use it for a shop, is it wasn't quite long enough. It's short of cars number 38, which is the first one I really got going on. Uh, it's still, if you were going to work on one end, you had to have the other end sticking out. So what we, one of the biggest events uh, was, we did have the loop put in, uh, and one of the big events of the summer was to take the car out and turn it around on the loop, and then we could work on the other end of the car. This was, this was a, a real big day, and we did that uh, several times. We did a car as big as the uh, Montreal and Southern Counties uh, baggage car number 504, which was about the size of this in there, but again, it wasn't. I think it was not 34 that was in it, because I think at that point that was still at Edaville. Well, not in my time. It was always here. Always here. Um, this was the parking lot for when the people first, when we first started riding. This was cleared a little bit uh, more smoothly in back. People would park in this direction here. And it was hard to imagine, 30, 40 cars here. The, uh, went right, on the queue. You'll hate it, this guy, as loud as you can. One, two, three. Hey! hey. <laughs> <laughs> when, he, when he used to, uh, boy, that's Dan Cohen, who's one of our trustees, and he used to uh, go to the Bennett Street car barn uh, at, in the Harvard Square in Cambridge, and uh, that's where he grew up. And they say, hey, get out of the pits there, young man. So every time I see him, I get, hey! <laughs> some of the molding up there if it's still left and everything it would be all new there would be virtually nothing, nothing except for parts like that anybody except conrad know the name of this building <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's named after a mountain west of manchester that means woman's breast <laughs> uncononic this was the power station for the uncononic um Charles Bertrand Root had moved up here 
from Waterbury, Connecticut, and uh, he had his three young daughters, one of whom I was engaged to, because when you're around here all by yourself in the summer and nobody else around, you get kind of close to people like that. And uh, I still see them, uh, the, the young the daughters, uh, they're, they're still around living in the community. But anyway, that house, I remember they're stripping all the wood shingles off, and there were big piles of them right here. And that's how we kept warm in the bunkhouse. Uh, you can imagine wood pine shingles, how much fire you get out of them and how long they would last. It was a lot of throwing them in the fire all, all night long and wrestling about three in the morning and froze. But anyway, that, that building uh, was made into their house, which they lived in. It was restored somewhat. And then Pat Butler, one of our uh, early members who was active at the time that I first came around, uh, one of the group of Harvard people, uh, Ben Minnick is one who still, I think, is here today, and Pat and uh, Bill Lamb. Four or five Harvard people that came in here. And so Pat, uh, had, he was not uh, involved with anybody at the time, he bought that house just, just to have it. And along with it came all the land to the west of the uh, fence here, which is uh, including where the three big car barns are and the restaurants and so forth, what we then became called Butler Grove. And uh, he donated the land to the north. This part here he sold us at not too friendly a price, but we did end up getting it. Then Dick and Eleanor Howe uh, have retired to uh, and made it to an absolutely gorgeous house. It's just absolutely wonderful. And they will live there as long as they are alive. And then it will become us for us to use in some way that the trustees define, whatever that may be. And I'm not sure they know at this point. It, 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 it's a real asset. Who owned that house before the Butler's did? Yeah, C.B. Root, who bought it from Brown, okay, who was a fellow that lived up the road. And they weren't friends of the museum at all. They were just we uh, were mentioning the gasoline power station. C.B. Root um, was not the world's friend of this guy. And uh, said, every time you start that generator, my television set flips. Uh, <laughs> and he, you know, we had to be careful, according to him, when we ran it. We didn't care. We, we, in fact, we did as much as we could to annoy him. Because he was such an annoying <laughs> Anybody ever saw him in overalls was the one day that we were over there moving that thing uh, over over here from there. The other thing uh, in our dream of building buildings, prefab buildings again, that I said were not being built, uh, they weren't available. There was a barn, a standard barn, 40 or 45 foot square barn uh, out in the front of that property. We jacked that building up, took the floor out, and built uh, a foot, 12 by 12 by 45 or 50 foot all those right up the road, and the, the rules were not there now. We just put them on either side of the GMC, sticking out 20 feet in either direction. <laughs> put them under this thing, bought a lot of wood rollers and enough planks, and, and rolled, pulled that building all the way up, and then turned it 90 degrees and across the road, right about where that cone is, maybe a little bit farther, and then turned it another uh, few degrees so that it's going to face the same direction as South Boston. last turn, it didn't quite make it because there was no foundation. All of our all these posts sitting on these big beams and the thing started to collapse. Then Hurricane Caroline came along and the building collapsed. And all that effort for absolutely nothing. So that's why South Boston is located there. That was the site of that. that now, uh, looking on here. Are you going South One? Huh? You have uh, your piece of one? I, yeah. Uh, actually, you may have a better one than I do. I, well, I gave you uh, a new one yesterday. What? Oh, you did? You put it on I gave What's his name? And I need my oil back from him. Okay, well, you have to speak to him. Oh, no, it's Bob. It's probably yeah. in the shop. Bob, yeah. Shop one, when we first started, was only that side. And then we, in our small thinking of the time, we thought, boy, we need an addition. We were going to really put this massive addition on here. That would be the machine shop for woodworking. And then that other thing up there was going to be the prop for a, uh, a full-size addition here. And you can see we've moved a little bit beyond that. Uh, 
but an awful lot happened. We have pictures of Danny Cohen working on the city of Manchester in there. He did some wonderful stuff when he was uh, oh, the ceiling panel. very thin and emaciated looking. He was black. I am now. <laughs> what condition it is now, but it was an open horse car. Uh, and then right behind you is a sleigh, a wintertime omnibus. And uh, that's the cross. This area you're standing in was where we had the machine shot. We had the uh, wood saw, we had a band saw, we had a uh, table saw, uh, drill press, and that's about all. And we actually restored uh, the city of Manchester. We started uh, number 2052 there, 504, uh, 34, 108. We were in here probably about 10 years every summer. Now, our shop program at that time of year was strictly summer. I was a school teacher, so this was my summer job. And then uh, Labor Day, it all shut down. So we were basically a 10-week program. This place in the wintertime was somewhat vacant. Uh, it, it really has now become a full-time operation, and this is one of the reasons we came to the crisis we did, that we were considering shutting the shop down in November 20th because of the expense of keeping going all year round. Back when it was a simple operation with high school kids operating in the summer, it wasn't so expensive, but now that it's all all uh, year round has become much more so. <coughs> These windows that you see came out of the Quonset house, that window that's right behind Phil there, which was the uh, start of the shop down in Linfield, Massachusetts. I'd forgotten we'd saved these. Um, that was the, uh, the building that collapsed in 1967, I think. Okay, why don't we... Biddeford to eat. And... Uh, it was a big thing. We had cars that didn't have very good heaters. We always used to talk about the after-dinner chill. And we went into Roland's Diner, which is no longer there, in Biddeford, and had our breakfast and noontime meal. I forget where we went for supper. I guess the Log Cabin Diner was right up where the antique place was. We would go there at night. We'd go into a diner and we'd say, well, how long are you going to last? Because they, they kept changing management and so forth. And Ben Minnick would pound the table because there wasn't enough water. They never gave him enough water there. Something tells me that second cup of coffee was kind of long in coming. Well, at Rollins, they had a Ben glass. It was one of these, you know, glasses that holds 32 ounces or something and kept it behind the counter. And when Ben would walk in, they'd fill it with water and put it in front of him and then put a pitcher next to it. <laughs> and where was the Bernie and the Bernie was right, right, right there. In fact, when we built this, we had to uh, move the Bernie to the crank kit in here. And I remember he nearly tipped over picking it up and we set it over on the track. They used to feed the trolley wire. There was a short stretch of trolley wire, and they, that switch was to turn 110 volts on to the trolley wire, and then they had low voltage bulbs in the car so they could get some lights and really feel like they, they had something there. This was the original uh, layout was right here. Uh, that track, uh, well, there was a track coming off this way and went closer to the bunkhouse and went right under the end of the South Shore car, and there's a couple of cars still remaining on, on, it, on, the, other, on the other end. When you drove in, the other entrance wasn't there. Right here was where the greeter stood. Danny Cohen being one of them, Mike Simons being one of them, and uh, George Cady was an old, older fellow. And they'd come in and, and George would say, don't step, stand and walk on the rails, don't open any streetcar doors. The guy was right here, I heard this thing. He was always, don't, 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 don't. He was, he's not exactly a friendly guy. I remember we got a donation of paint remover, and there was a drum of it sitting right there in the black on the summer day. And you, I knew it was a volatile substance. And all of a sudden, we're noticing this little stream of paint remover blowing up and over. And before we noticed it, several cars had drawn by. Now, we didn't say a word. <laughs> 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 so we were a little bit further than those days. <laughs> the paint car was just now up back in the shop. Now the entrance was in this way and out on the Burma Road up there. So that there was a, this was a little bit, seemed a little bit narrower. It was chopped out by the Atlantic Shoreline. Uh, many times in the 70s we had uh, picnics up there. Fred Perry's wife would put them on. We'd have uh, picnics and, and barbecues and so forth. Kind of a neat thing we do that all the time. So before the bunkhouse was built, when I first came here, it was being put together 
That would have been the summer of 54, 53, 54. So people stayed in streetcars or uh, in the Bernie car, which had room for about four or five. It had a little hot plate in it. It had uh, no running water. Again, we used to have to carry it five gallon buckets of water. We had running water as fast as you could run. <laughs> and uh, the one time I decided I was going to be the cook because I thought we wasted an awful lot of time going into Biddeford. So these were the old electric hot plates, very slow, and, we, and there wasn't room for a setting. We maybe had eight or ten visitors here. I remember the complaints about the people at the second shift for their spaghetti or whatever it was I was making because it was hours later <laughs> to wait. So this was really a wonderful thing. Charlie Chase, our member from, her name is Boatyard. But he loved streetcars. So that building was built out of stuff when the ports was dumped. And uh, it was only half as long as it was, but it was a tremendous improvement. One row. So Friday night, when the people would come up from Boston, I, I was closer, so I'd get in there early, and, and, and of course, working here, I'd try to get to bed early, but the people from Boston would come stumbling in about 11 o'clock at night and knock things over, and I finally, I couldn't stand it because I, I couldn't get to work there. It was heated by a kerosene stove, uh, the old-fashioned kind, and it would go in the middle of the night, and then about 4 in the morning, it would stop doing Somebody had to get up. <laughs> and the uh, town code enforcement officer made us upgrade, and then they were going to upgrade even more and put a, a septic system in their own well. So it's pretty posh here. And this is Stonehenge. Henry Brainerd, again, our visionary engineer. He was sometimes visionary up in the clouds here. This was supposed to imitate the two-story car barn, St. James Street car barn in Main Street car barn in New Haven of the Connecticut Company. And I guess he was either thinking of either a second story running the cars up there somehow or having his engineering office up there or something like that. And uh, they got, I think, three of these done. And then we were going to put a pit here. And I remember in my first summer here working with Ralph Brown, who, uh, well, Ben Minnick got one of his classmates to supervise myself and Roger Jenkins, who were the two summer kiddies working at 35 cents an hour. And uh, we were oh, living, and we dug the pit here. So this was going to be the shop in conjunction with that. And uh, the uh, foundation for the other uh, hole was there. Uh, the, the other, the other uh, column. And uh, we eventually we, decided we ran into a huge rock, and we decided that was not the best place to put the, uh, the pit. So we pulled over one of so one of the concrete posts is in there. This is as far as it ever got. I mean, they were going to pour them across the top. Imagine doing things the hardest possible way. <laughs> this edition of the uh, bunkhouse was built by Irving Walker, who uh, since has died, and he uh, did that uh, on his vacation. He did a very, very nice job. In the building, of course, needs a lot of work. He's done some school. I'm not even sure the first bunkhouse came out right. here. I think it came just past that window. It's now uh, available or scrap or whatever. It's uh, a vib electric vibrating type, extremely high maintenance. We use it a lot, but it's just not worth it. Two uh, grinding, uh, Goldschmidt grinders for grinding thermite wells in the track. Goldschmidt Thermite Company. And we actually used these one time. This one came to us in that condition. Somebody had picked it up the wrong way at the end. This one I can remember using and actually running back and forth. For a number of years, our corporate secretary was in the class with the year. Much, much, much better for <laughs> And this is available. Uh, it was, we almost got rid of it, and then uh, it didn't happen. Then uh, this is the, is the power station, the old power station. It started out originally uh, with a thing called a pagoda. The pagoda contained a one-lung gas engine, not gasoline, but gas engine. And George Burdick had it wired somewhere with the great big flywheel on the top. And they were going to burn used crankcase oil in it to power our stuff. Fortunately, it didn't happen. And we traded that for a, a Massey Harris tractor, which was mostly transmission and wheels and an engine in the front. And we used to use that for towing things around. 
It was had iron wheels with big cleats on it, so it shook the dickens out of you. Most of us didn't call it Massey Harris. We called it Nasty Harris. You're right. And it didn't have a very tight cooling system, so in the wintertime, in the wintertime we didn't put antifreeze in it. We'd just run it for a few minutes and <laughs> shut it off and cool down again. Uh, New York Central Railroad. Yeah. Sterling Viking II, 300 horsepower gasoline e engine, for with a diesel or with an electric 600 volt generator on the back side. And uh, it sat right there on that pad. And the summer of the fall of 1953, when I first came up, they were working on it. And I remember my first job was they had the generator suspended uh, from the one of the beams inside there, and I was painting Rust-Oleum gray on the, on the generator. Uh, in December, they finally got it ticking over, and to make it run, we had the big radiators on the top and a big tank, and we had to go and chop ice uh, in the creek, which is way over that way, about 500 feet, and carry it over and pour it into the top, and of course you had to have the generator running fairly soon, or the water would freeze, and they finally got the thing running. And uh, they had an expansion tank on the top, uh, which they thought would take care of the, the engine. Well, the first the cooling of the engine and the radiators. The first radiators looked nice, but they weren't very efficient. And so the engine would overheat in almost no time, and then this plume of steam going up 100 feet, blowing out through the expansion tank. So then they got some other radiators and put them on. There were two big fans up there, and uh, that began to cool it off. In the night time, uh, again, because they, you couldn't afford to use the antifreeze in that, the system wasn't that tight. They had a tank, which you can see there. And when the engine was running slowly, the water would drain out of the tank, uh, the radiators on the roof, and fill that tank. And then when it would run fast, it would push it up into the radiators to cool it. Well, again, before the bunkhouse was expanded, uh, we would sleep in there, in the power station. And the engine, the heat of the engine, would keep us warm until about 3 o'clock in the morning, anyway sleeping in these old army uh, sleeping bags that were made, they were, they were <laughs> army color, and I don't think it was all because that was the way they started out, but they became that color after, after a, number, <laughs> a number of years. So this engine was used, uh, we had a gasoline tank up on the roof, we used, uh, I think we were able to get it pumped in there, uh, but it, it, it never seemed to run well. It uh, was extremely uh, cost, uh, very expensive to run. Uh, it had eight-inch cylinders and four valves in each one, and uh, it was just a problem. I, we would start it up, and it would fart and bang it for <laughs> miles and miles and miles away. And it had four magnetos, as I remember it, and four spark plugs, with four, four separate magnetos and four plugs in each in each cylinder. Well, it, uh, it was just a pain in the neck. So it finally swallowed a valve and stopped. Meanwhile, we had stopped running over at U.S. Route 1, and in one of the trailers, which is now up the shop, right there, we had the Winton engine, which was uh, from a uh, Boston and Maine gas electric car. And so we ran that until it swallowed a valve and, and <laughs> died right there. And fortunately, within a few weeks, the other power station was running. So we went through two gas, just awful, awful gasoline. It just took so much time. But this was a, a, an interesting place for about 10 years. And the system with this low power, so you had lights and you could have a compressor running on a car, so you had brakes. And then you'd notch up and, and blow the circuit breaker on that low power, and then it would automatically come up on the high power, the Usually. big generator. Usually. Well, most now, of the time when I was design. here. It was between, the the, <laughs> between the time when uh, these two gasoline generators quit and we got the present system working, actually it was the motor generator and then the rectifier set, we had the Burma, no, the Tokyo Express, we had the Boston and Maine 500, which was the inspection car, which is in the shop being restored right now, towing the Japanese car up the line. This is this was our public offering in those days there. Uh, it was kind of slow, and uh, I, it finally did, did the rear end in, in the, uh, the differential in, in the, in the uh, inspection car, but... Uh, we, uh, 
while Donald mentions that Japanese car, we had the dimensions for it, so we'd figured clearances to haul it from Boston up here, and then it arrived in a crate. And we had to take the bottom of the crate out and set it down to where we got approximately the vertical clearance that we were expecting. And once we got it here and got it out of the remains of the crate, we sold the crate to Emil Drowen, who was the gravel man around here. He made a bulldozer garage out of it. Ah. <laughs> now, when we built the power station, we didn't have the luxury of these things here. So when we slept in there at night, you could see how uh, uh, that air conditioning yeah. in December and January. <laughs> This is the uh, library annex, the Milwaukee Road boxcar, painted up a few years ago with a Vancouver brand The library, and especially the library, started out as a, this was going to be our carpenter shop. And believe it or not, the city of Manchester was in there for a while. In there? In there. I was the one that put it in there. That was one of my projects, was to get it in there. Other end. Oh, the other end? I forgot. Okay. I think. I'm not certain now. This was, uh, you know, we, were, we really couldn't imagine anything very large. Uh, be careful right about there where Little River, which was the initial facility, was, right beside this tree. Uh, anyway, uh, that was in there for a while, and uh, we were going to do a restoration in there, but it was obvious it wasn't big enough. So when we decided we were going to be here for good, that became the, the store. So it started out that way. Then when we got the Quonset Hut from Linfield, along with it, attached to it, was a barber shop. And the barber shop was uh, just a structure, well, it was about half the length of that. And so that was attached on the other side. Well, I think we can see uh, from it when we go on the other end. And it was then added to there, and then added to here, with somewhat inadequate foundation, as you can see, uh, because everything, I believe, was straight when it was built. We found that the, uh, this whole back, it's built on a lake, for one thing. Uh, and if you can see what's, what's happened, so there's really no foundation in it. The building, I don't know what holds it together. A while ago, we had to cut the trees down because there was so much pine needles on it, they were just rotting the roof. And uh, I don't remember it was being as bad as that. So you're saying down. that uh, the annex here was a barbershop at one point? From here to the middle, you can see the break. Yeah, the of, uh, so it's really three separate buildings.